stick with what you know, execute what you've done in training today. And, and I know that's, you know, reiterating what, um, a million other people have said, um, before me, but we, we, st- we still see people making still, these mistakes, don't we? So, so you will still see people making the same mistake and they come up to you going, yeah, I know I shouldn't have worn these shoes. <laughs> well, why did you? <laughs> That Triathlon Show 164. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Sarah McClarty. Sarah is a former professional triathlete for Team USA, and she's known for particularly being a very strong swimmer, coming from a competitive swimming background. Today, she coaches age groupers as well as uh, is a team leader with the elite USA Triathlon National Team. So she travels with the, the professionals to the ITU World Triathlon Series events and helps them out and coaches them, those sorts of things. So she is the perfect candidate to talk about today's topic, which is executing on race day. And that's something that uh, I'm well aware that it seems, yeah, I haven't done enough of these episodes, put simply. So I was really keen on having somebody somebody other than myself, because I've done a few solo episodes on race day execution myself before, and uh, I'll link to them in the show notes as well, by the way. But uh, I'm really keen to talk with uh, with a coach and also a former pro athlete like Sarah to hear what goes through their mind and how they make sure that they prepare and execute to the best of their ability when you are on the starting line and when you are in the race, when it really matters. So we'll talk about things like preparation for the race, going through your race morning routine, what you do and what you think about when you stand on the start line and wait for the gun to go off, and how to execute a great swim, bike, run and two great transitions. But before we go into that, big thanks to today's sponsors. First, we have Retool. No matter what your level of uh, cycling ability is, comfort is always crucial uh, for your time spent on the bike to be effective. If you have a position that is correct for your body and your anatomy, that will keep you aligned on the bike and that will help you prevent injuries. A good position will also help you produce more power and you can sustain a higher power output for longer. You will have better position endurance in that good riding position for you. When I get a bike fit, I have confidence if I go to retool a bike fitter that uh, all of these things fall into place for me and everything is adapted to my anatomy and my riding style. You can learn more about the retool bike fit process on retool.com forward slash TTS as in that triathlon show and retool is spelled R-E-T-U-L. So go to that URL and uh, find out where your nearest retool experience center is and uh, schedule an appointment. Also, big thanks to Precision Hydration. They make electrolytes that help you get hydrated and stay hydrated in training. Some exciting news from the Precision Hydration camp since they last sponsored the show is that they have recently launched in both Australia and New Zealand. And of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, you guys are in the middle of summer, so uh, this comes uh, in handy. You can go out on your long rides and long runs and a sweat, but you can stay hydrated and make sure that you get your sodium in particular, which is the most important electrolyte, and that you get that replaced as you lose sodium through your sweat losses on those long uh, workouts. That is very important if you want to have a quality workout and if you want to sustain a quality output throughout that workout. That's not to say that for Northern Hemisphere athletes we can forget about uh, hydration currently as we are in winter. Uh, no, most of us are probably training indoors on the trainer, some of us maybe even on the treadmill, and the amount of sweat that you lose in those indoor rides and runs is uh, very significant. In many cases it can be a lot more than you would lose outdoors. And uh, again, if you want to retain that same workout quality towards the end of a long, sweaty indoor workout, then you have to replenish electrolyte. So go to precisionhydration.com, take the free online sweat test to find out how much electrolyte 
uh, electrolytes you lose in your sweat and uh, what sort of concentration you need for your individual needs. And use the promo code that triathlon show all one word, all caps, to get your first box of precision hydration electrolyte for free. So without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Sarah McClarty. Today's guest is Sarah McClarty. Sarah, how are you today? I'm good, Michael. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. Can you, can you just introduce yourself uh, a bit for the listeners that uh, may not have heard you or read your <laughs> articles in Triathlete Magazine or things like that? Sure. Uh, real quick version. Um, I am a former professional triathlete uh, and professional swimmer that now lives in Claremont, um, Florida. And I coach, uh, age group athletes and I travel with the, um, USA triathlon national team to the world cups and world championships. Um, I'm upwards of eight years of being, uh, one of the writers for triathlete magazine, always about swim stuff. And, um, yeah, I enjoy triathlon. I have been a triathlete since I was seven. So this is uh, 100% a part of my life and I love it. And I'm looking forward to many years involved with the sport to come. Wow. Yeah, that, that that's an early start in, in this sport. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> yeah. So the, the topic for today uh, is uh, really race execution and, and performance on race day. But uh, it starts a bit before the race, doesn't it? How how do you look at things? When, when does race preparation start? Good question. Um, I work with my athletes, you know, and when I say work with them, I just continually yell at them the same thing. <laughs> um, you know, th- that what you do in practice is, um, is race practice. So we always just sort of reiterate that um, perfect practice um, prevents piss poor results. <laughs> so, uh, you know, trying to do the right thing each day in, in practice um, so that on race day, you get to turn your brain off and just do what comes naturally. And uh, what what are the things that you should really be thinking of? Can you give some, a couple yeah. of specific examples? We... Um, work on obviously one of the main things is for my long distance athletes is executing, um, race day nutrition on, um, some longer key sessions. Uh, that's real big for us, especially here in Florida in the heat through the summer, which is, um, when a majority of people are doing triathlons because it's warm. Um, but for us it's blazing hot. So, uh, executing race nutrition can be difficult. Um, can you actually put in enough fluids at the same time as your body is just being, you know, drained by the sun and the humidity here in Florida. So we, we try and execute that on our big training days. Um, and then we coach, uh, my swim, excuse me, my triathlon team, we have, um, upwards of seven or eight, uh, swim practices each week. So that gives us an opportunity. Um, one of them is even in the open water in the lake every week on a weekly basis. Um, so that gives everyone an opportunity to practice that swim execution, which I feel like, you know, once you're out on the road on the bike and, and once you're running, that's sort of pretty much a solo event. It's it's you by yourself and, and not much going on. But we try to throw as many, you know, bumps in the road at our swimmers um, in the water as, as possible so that no matter what happens on race day, um, they can go up. Oh, I've done this in practice when coach Sarah ran into me on her paddleboard, you know, like <laughs> big deal. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> there, there's a fun commercial on, on YouTube. Uh, I don't even remember what it's a commercial for, but it cliff. Bar. Yeah. Cliff yes. bar. The simulation. I use, I show that commercial all the time. <laughs> we, we'll link to it in the show notes <laughs> because it's, it's just so, so entertaining. Yes, yes. Else. So, so what, what, what about the, the more, uh, the more immediate uh, preparation, the the days or, and perhaps week leading up to a race, not training specific this time, but things like planning, logistics, etc. What, what are the, the checklist things that people should be ticking off? Right, right. Working through those things. About uh, a week, two weeks to a week and a half ahead of time, I send out. Um, ahead of my athletes, a, you know, a races, um, I send out a, uh, 
a uh, little questionnaire that they have to fill out and get back to me. And it goes over all the things. Where are you staying? How close is it to the race? Does it have a kitchen? What will you be eating the night before? Where will you be eating? Um, all the way through race morning. Um, what will you be eating? What time will you be driving to the race? Will you be parking? Will your spouse be dropping you off? Um, and, and we go through all those things uh, at least a week and a half ahead of time in the big race. And I've had more than once someone go, oh, didn't think about this. Um, so, I mean, that's why, you know, you have a coach is because a written plan that you buy for $12 off the internet isn't going to check up on you, um, and make sure that you've gone through all these small things that, um, that you need to go over. Um, and then also I'll send out, um, well, usually I'll put it on their training peaks, probably four days, uh, three to four days ahead of leaving. I actually put a workout block in their training peaks. that says pack for the race and send me a picture. So they do, you know, the whole flat Stanley thing where they lay out all of their stuff and, and take a picture of it and send it to me. And we just sort of, you know, make sure that everything is, is covered and being packed. Um, and, uh, bike has been taken into the bike shop ahead of time too. So those are kind of the, the week to two weeks, um, ahead of time that I, uh, put on training peaks or send out a questionnaire that, that we make sure that, uh, leading into the race, you have covered and checked all of your boxes. That's, that's very clever. I like that idea with, with having the athletes send a picture to you of, of their packing. Yeah. What, what about a race morning, assuming again, that this is a, typical age group race so typically a morning start not a wts afternoon start uh, what uh, what happens from when you wake up to to when you're standing on the start line right S- similar thing i i do make sure that my athletes have gone through their predicted uh, race morning uh, at least once hopefully you know more than once ahead of time on some key training session that I've writ- wrote written for them that says you know it starts at 7 a.m I need you know your wheels up at 7 a.m on your bike so let's make sure that you can do everything that you want to do on a race morning beforehand so for that again making sure that breakfast has been had um, alarm is set for at least three hours before the race so you can get up start eating because it does take, you know, upwards of, of two and a half to three hours to start digesting some of the, the oatmeal or, or slow digesting things that you want to be eating in that morning for a long race. Um, and then, uh, Again, we go through um, the same kind of warm up over and over and over again. And I actually took this away from when I was a swimmer at the University of Florida. And at the beginning of each season, our coaches would sit us down and everybody would get like one of those index cards, like a three by five, and you would write out your race, um, not race morning, but your swim meet warm up. And for us, I mean, that would be once in the morning for prelims and do it again once in the evening for finals. Um, and then multiple times through the year, but they wanted us to write out exactly what we were going to do for warm up, and then execute that over and over and over again through 10 dual meets of the season. And then, you know, all the big competition meets all the way up to NC2As and national championships and everything. So, once you're five or six swim meets into it, you don't think about that warm up anymore. You don't have to go, you know, am I, what was I, what should I do after this? It was executing the exact plan that you had written down at the beginning of the season and making that a sort of a groove for yourself and, and giving you that sort of teaching you to turn the brain off, rely on the body, not think your way through it. Because on race day, you cannot think your way through anything. It should be happening um, completely naturally and, and subconsciously. And, and so we do that same kind of thing, um, with my athletes is that no matter if it's an A race, a B race, or the local thing down the road that, that we do, they will execute that exact same, uh, warm up, and, and race morning is no different. Yeah. What, what, what about if they are not allowed to get in the water, for example, for, for some races, what do they do then? Right. Um, most of mine is a run warm up anyways. Um, going with the fact that you're always going to be able to do that. We don't even talk about bike warm up. Um, obviously 
when you get to a super high elite end, you're going to see people come in with their trainers um, and, you know, um, WTS races or the IT style, they are going to be warming up on their bike. It is later in the day. So not as difficult. Um, I keep mine to a run warm up. It can be done shorter. You don't get um, cold as easily. It doesn't require as much equipment. Um, your wetsuit isn't wet for standing around after you've done that warm up. So most of the time we are going without a swim warm up, unless it's again, middle of the summer here in Florida, the water is 900 degrees and the air is boiling. Um, we stay out of the water. Um, I do have some of my top end athletes invest in, uh, pair of uh, swim stretch cords that stays in their sort of race bag or wetsuit bag. And then they just sort of tie up the stretch cords to a a fence or a bench or, or their spouse or me. I've even held them <laughs> sometimes <laughs> while they execute some, you know, maybe five minutes of 30 seconds on 30 seconds off of just uh, swim motions with those stretch cords. And, and before everyone rushes out to get stretch cords, you want to keep in mind that this is just a warm up and sort of a muscle activation. So don't go getting the most heavy resistance, stretch cords that you can get on the market. It's actually the opposite. You just want the low end resistance. Some people you see with just some TheraBands um, or stuff that they've picked up from a, a physical therapist or a rehab place where it's just super lightweight, travels easy, and um, can be easily replaced. But just some lightweight cords and you just sort of hold on to the ends, do a little swim motions and, and get those muscles activated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just quickly, because it's always interesting to hear what the elites are doing. Let's say we have a, mm -hmm. a WTS afternoon start. When when, and how do they warm up? I, I've heard that, that some elites, they do uh, go out and do two sessions earlier in the day, one early morning and then one later on in the morning. So so two, two workouts done already by the time that the, the race starts, if it's a sprint especially. Uh, what, what's, what do you see? What did you do when you were racing and what do, do USAT athletes now do, for example? Yes. Uh, when I was racing, um, so depressed, uh, we didn't have sprints. <laughs> so, oh man, all those things you look at them doing nowadays, wishing you were still doing it. But, um, the sprints of course do take more. That whole saying goes, the shorter the race, the longer the warm up is ahead of time. Um, so you're right. They, most athletes are out in the morning, um, doing a training session. I'll probably be waking up in my hotel room, um, you know, sitting in front of the window or going down to breakfast. Uh, and most of the athletes will be coming back in from their morning run to grab breakfast on the way up. So I'm usually seeing them, um, after they've done, and it's, it's typically a run warm up in the morning so that you have the longest uh, recovery time from that before the race. And then, uh, do, do they do anything, a anything lot. a bit faster in that run as well to wake up the system and the engines? Absolutely. Um, if you stand outside the hotel, you can see um, one of our top athletes, Kevin McDowell, is a popular one that I'll see. Just right, he'll he'll go out, do his run, come back, and then right in front of the hotel, he'll be doing his activation drills. He'll be doing some strides, um, getting up to you know almost full speed, just to get like you said that heart rate up, clear the sleep out, wake up, get a little sweat going on. Obviously, it's it's nothing that um, is workoutness, you know, you don't want to feel tired from it. It would tire us out because <laughs> they're, they're good. But, um, for them, it's just a light little activation going through those drills. Um, a lot of our athletes have worked with Bobby McGee, the run specialist so that they all have sort of a, a morning plan. And I'm sure it's exactly like what I was talking about. It is the same over and over and over again so that they know that they can rely on it. They don't have to think their way through it. They're going to do the same thing. Um, so yeah, some, some strides, um, a lot of places, uh, I'll even see them finding a downhill so that they can get up to that speed without, um, so much effort involved, um, get the legs turning over with the ease of sort of a, a gentle downhill slope, um, in front of the hotel or, or something similar. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we travel with trainers. So no matter what 
cold weather, middle of a big city like Hamburg, Germany, um, they're on their bikes doing a spin warm up either in their hotel rooms or these muscles right here are carrying the trainers to the race site so that they can um, safely ride their bike um, into the transition area um, athlete lounge and then uh, we set their bikes up on the trainer. Big example of that is this year, um, Katie Zafaris took us up um, on that offer to, to utilize that trainer pretty much before all of her races. Worked out real well for her. She had a phenomenal season. Um, but she she knew that she needed to be coming out of the swim with her legs ready to fire on that bike because uh, so much of her races um, were relying uh, on having a good swim, having a small pack out of the swim, trying to, to stay away on the bike. So you can't wait for those legs to warm up in, in a sprint or an Olympic distance at that kind of level. Um, and then the finally third sport, I would probably say that 90% of the athletes are at least getting in the water in that mid afternoon, um, before the race. And I would say it's, it's probably a smaller percentage of some of the races we've been to that have been out there, cold temperatures or cold water and, um, and they don't want to be in, but still I'll watch the tiniest little thing. Um, like a Taylor Spivey who probably weighs like, you know, a hundred pounds soaking wet and she, Hamburg, I'm in six jackets because I'm cold and I'm standing around, but boom, she's right into the water to go through because she knows she needs it. She knows her mentality is relying on that exact warm up plan that she needs to execute. So in the water she goes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Really interesting to hear what's going on on the, the elite side of things. Now, the most exciting part of the race, standing on the start line, waiting for the gun <laughs> to go off. What, what, uh, yeah. what should your mindset be like? What, what should you be thinking? <clears throat> Calm thoughts. <laughs> um, definitely calm thoughts. Um, you shouldn't be thinking about anything beyond the present moment and, and getting through that first uh, 400 meters of the swim uh, calmly and, and not destroying your race in that first 400 meters. And, and I would say witnessed, I've witnessed it myself and I've also um, had this happen to me is that the first 400 meters of a race, um, can make or break your race. And I would say, especially in a long distance race, like an Ironman, if you burn up all your matches in the first 400 fighting and, and being aggressive and, and, you know, struggling, um, that will come back to haunt you. Same, same with a, a half Ironman. Um, so just thinking calm thoughts and, and, preparing yourself for that 400 ahead of you and, and getting through that. And then as we know, it, it usually thins out, you know, in the next um, 400 meters and, and things become much more calm. Your mentality shifts to race focus rather than, you know, holy crap, I'm here, I'm doing this focus. And, and you just sort of um, revert back to that subconscious thought. So we, we work a lot on, um, here at the lake, uh, in our open water swims, we do starts and, and we group people together and we have them, you know, beat each other up and, and just sort of with the challenge of, can you remain calm? How are you going to react to this? Um, and, and how are you going to keep your focus on yourself? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, so for the race execution itself, then we'll get into each of the disciplines, but uh, before that, do you have any general advice? It can be anything physical, uh, mental, nutrition, hydration, ge general things that you want to make sure that the listeners get uh, and uh, take home as messages from, from this interview. The, hopefully the same exact thing that every other person will say, and that is don't do anything different on race day. Stick with what you know. Don't make changes in equipment. Don't go to the expo the night before and get sold on some new hydration system. Just stick with what you know. Execute what you've done in training today. And and I know that's, you know, reiterating what um, a million other people have said um, before me, but you we, we, still, we still see people making these mistakes don't we so so still see people making the same mistake and they come up to you going yeah i know i shouldn't have worn these shoes <laughs> well why did you <laughs> yep perfect so so getting into the swim then so we we already 
talked about uh, the the start and then it's thinning out mm-hmm. but is there anything else that we we should be thinking about when we're actually in the swim to execute a good strong performance in that leg right i work a lot on stroke technique i mean that's one of the the key parts of my swim like a pro business is doing swim lessons swim technique instruction video analysis and and working with people on on making um you know changes to improve their swim i i try and leave I try and end sessions with, you know, some people I know I'll only see them once. Maybe they came into town just to, you know, for the holidays because I'm right near Disney. So we, we snag a lot during the holidays when they're vacationing with their family and they're like, Oh, you know, I'm going to come over and have a lesson. Um, and, and I reiterate it over and over again with people who I do know that I'm seeing multiple times is when, I talk about it in, in training. I say, listen, I've given you three to four key things from today's lesson that you're going to go home and you're going to work on making changes. But I want you to think about those technique changes in the warm up, in the drill set, in the easy, you know, first part of your workout. And then again, at the end, um, in the recovery or the cool down. And, and maybe if you have two main sets, whatever you do easy in between those main sets, um, But to not try to overanalyze the small, little, finite, minuscule details when you're trying to work hard, you know? Um, So over time, the goal is, is that those little things that you're working on and that you're really focusing on in the, in the slow part and and drilling, et cetera, will start carrying themselves over to swimming fast. But if you start thinking about the four things that I told you while you're trying to swim a hundred under one thirty, your, your brain's going to explode and, and, you know, um, it's just not going to work out. So that same kind of thing shifts to the race. Listen, in the race, you're not going to be fixing your technique. Like, let's just go and do what you're comfortable with. Um, and, and it, for me, it does. I do say this because of course it stems from somebody who came to me after race and said, yeah, I I got through the swim and I was thinking about this, 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 this. And and I just put my head in my hands. I said, why didn't you just think about the race and, and being present in the moment? Um, and really just putting those things to the side, because if you do it right, you get your swim lessons now in the winter. You have your technique focus that you're going to work on for the next six months. And then you have your A race. And by then it should be subconscious. It should be your new stroke technique. It shouldn't be something that you're thinking about um, among 2,000 people uh, in right. the Ironman. Yeah. So, do, do you get a lot yeah, of... Yeah, that's how you execute a swim. <laughs> do, you, do you get a lot of people that, that contact you the, a couple of weeks before Ironman Florida or something asking you to fix, what do you fix their think, technique? Michael? <laughs> What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, most of those people, it's more, I mean, I'm not going to throw everyone under the bus. Most of those people, it's, I can't swim this distance. Help me. And I work with those people just as much as I do with a, you know, I'm swimming a 115. I want to swim a 105 in an Ironman. So, you know, those people are more for thinking about their performance. And yeah, they're coming to me in the winter and, and we're going through the motions there. But the people that I am seeing in that two months leading into an Ironman or even four weeks leading into a half Ironman is, oh, I actually can't do this. I need help. And I happily go out and work with them. Um, I live 200 meters from the, the waterfront park that we train at open water. So for me, it's, I get on my cruiser bike, I roll down the hill, I meet the person, you know, for an hour, a couple times a week leading into the race. And, and by the time we get to the race, no problem they're you know, powering through the, the 1.2 miles. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, T1, what, uh, what goes into a perfect, perfectly executed T1? Um, gosh, that's a good question for myself. When I was racing, um, my mind would shift to T1 in the last, uh, little bit of the swim. Um, just trying to think ahead and just sort of, um, one last time running through in my mind, what I'm going to do when I hit the land and, and stand up. And that's sometimes reminding myself, um, Sarah, you're in a wetsuit. First thing, stand up goggles on your head find the, um, zipper, you know, start taking your wetsuit off. Um, 
So I would go through one last time, even though as an elite athlete, I'd gone through T1 and T2 more times than I can count, especially since I started triathlon at seven years old and my mom was a stickler for having transition practices in the garage. Um, but just one last time of um, running through those couple things as I found myself in a calm spot near the end of the swim um, to prepare myself and, uh, and then run through it. And again, just like anything, if, if you want it to happen smoothly, you got to go through it, um, many times. And when I assign brick workouts for my athletes, it will say, have your shoes, your running belt, you're in your hat, sitting on the ground in the garage, pull in, you know, or sitting just inside your car. Cause we have a lot of people drive to where they, they ride, um, put the bike on transition into your equipment and get going. You know, this isn't a time to check your phone. Um, it isn't a time to, you know, dawdle around, rinse off, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, again, practicing it and going through it so that it becomes subconscious. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and getting on, on the bike then, so if we get into that part of the, the race execution. Right. Um, you know, I liked what I was talking about earlier, how um, your legs do need to be ready for that. And I used um, Katie Zafaris as an example um, and because she was uh, executing her warm-up on a trainer ahead of time to get her legs ready. Uh, Long-distance stuff, I don't really um, worry about any of my athletes. We do talk about spending the first 10 to 15 minutes um, – rehydrating and refueling. Cause again, we're talking, you know, a half iron man, 30 minutes and, and up and, and obviously a full iron man, um, upwards of an hour where you, unless you're doing a two loop swim course, you haven't had anything to eat or drink. So we don't, my athletes do not go into the beginning part of the bike. Like they're in a race, they go into it, starting their rolling buffet And they get going with the eating and drinking right away. And we really have made that saying, uh, a rolling buffet, really um, critical here in Florida. Because if you're not constantly, you know, rehydrating and re-electrolyting, the the amount of sweat that we lose here in the summer months is insane. So, you know, some people sort of put together like a timeline of, oh, I'm going to drink here at, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes. for us, it's pretty much stick that straw in your mouth. And just every time you breathe in, take some liquid with you. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about never being thirsty and drinking beforehand. So that beginning of the bike is, is just sort of getting, getting ready from the swim. Um, and then that allows the legs to warm up while you're focused more on your nutrition and sort of positioning yourself and maybe making sure that all your equipment is set and your feet are in your shoes and and everything's clipped on and and ready to go. Um, That gives your legs an opportunity to warm up. I I don't know how many times me as an athlete, I would um, hit that bike or even running out of the swim. I would just hit it so hard that my quads would seize up. Um, after being horizontal in the swim, nice little gentle kick as you're going along. And then suddenly you just stand up and you ask for 110% from your body. And, um, multiple times I would have my quad seize up and, and my race would, would just suffer for the rest of the day. I would just make it to the finish line. Um, so allowing yourself to get that warm up in before you push. Um, and then, uh, we work with something. We either work with rate of perceived exertion, heart rate, um, power, speed, um, something where, um, in our pre-race plan, we've outlined, uh, what you're going to be looking at or what you're going to be trying to feel, um, and then work on executing that for the bike. Yeah, perfect. What about if you are an, an Ironman athlete, for example, or, or even a half Ironman athlete, and and uh, it's it's a longer day out, and uh, you get to that uh, those latter stages of of the bike, and you are in a in a darker place, which uh, <laughs> quite often happens. Uh, what? So yeah. How how do you get out of that or manage that uh, those rough patches? Right. I I did play around with an athlete this year going into their first Ironman and, and wondering how they would do. They were wondering how they would do. 
So Michael, I actually brought in a little bit of my adventure racing experience. And this, these last couple of years I've gotten into adventure racing. We've with my teammates, we've gone as long as six days and um, in Wyoming and four days in Belize. And uh, there are dark places in multi-day adventure racing. <laughs> um, so one thing was having a snack that was waiting for you at a transition area that you, it, it it's not good for you. It's not racing food. It's not another gel. It's not another bar. It's a piece of pizza. It's, you know, a Coke. It's, um, a, oh, Pringles were our, you know, addiction during adventure racing. It's having something in your bin ahead of you at each adventure race that you have to look forward to, puts you in a happy place, you know, puts a smile on your face, refreshes that dark spot. So for this Iron Man athlete of mine who did his first, he had a aid station out on the bike. And I said, what would make you the happiest, you know, and, and I can't remember what it was he put in there, but he put it in there and he, he said it just changed his whole perspective and, and, uh, on the race. So, you know, putting some kind of treat, um, for those of us that are serious, you know, maybe it's uh, saving your favorite flavor gel or, um, you know, putting something there, um, maybe uncovering some words that somebody has written you. Um, I have a couple athletes who will tape things that either, you know, inspire them or their spouse has said to them. So that could be another thing. Maybe the spouse um, hides a, a note on your arrow bars or your handlebar stem. And at, at a point in the race, you uncover those words and, and you use them as motivation along the way. Just anything to completely take you out of the race um, and change your perspective. These are fantastic tips. I, I really love them. Re really great mm -hmm. advice. Uh, and uh, T2, I guess we, we already covered sort of. It's similar to T1. Or is there anything to, to add there? Yeah, I, it is. It's so similar to T1. It's it's easier than T1. Um, I'm thinking through <sighs> for for the long for, for the long distance athletes. Do do you like them yeah. to really take their time, or what what do you what tactic do you prescribe for for them? Depends. Yeah, good question. It depends on the level of athlete, and and you know your transition can only be discussed based on whether you're the athlete that is going to be you know snacking and changing clothes in transition or if you're the athlete that is going to throw your bike at a volunteer and and you're already off on the run so i mean that kind of thing is again um practice it go over it um but again a lot of and again i coach based on the great coaches you know that i've had in my past but one thing i remember um somebody saying to me was keeping in mind that as you start moving your legs on the run is that they've just been doing these little, you know, maybe one, 172.5 millimeter circles for the last hour or eight hours. And to remember that when you head off running is that you need to not go into your full stride right away. So just making sure that through transition and through that first kilometer of the run, you're taking small steps that are allowing your body to adjust and allowing the muscles to shift and, and, and flow differently before you get into whatever your stride may be. And that thought process I have found, and I know we are talking about the run now, Michael, um, that thought process of taking small steps, treating your legs like they're still on the bike has shown my athletes how to not take that first 1K out fast. Because if I make them focus on that and, and we focus on not cramping up in the first K and, and, and getting into it slowly and letting your legs loosen up, they can't run, you know, a 530 first mile because that's not what they're focusing on. So I have found that, that, you know, going through transition and, and heading out on the run with that idea starts the runoff on a on a better foot yeah yeah uh, what what else on the run what what other tips do you do you have gosh same kind of thing on the bike um my big thing when i was racing um 
because I was in Florida and I was from a swimming background, we found, (laughs) we found, I found myself lying on the side of the road multiple times or in an ambulance um, with an IV in my arm and not remembering uh, the last two miles on the run towards the finish or um, not even getting to the finish because I've passed out before I got there. Um, and, and I think we as coaches, obviously one of our, um, we as athletes coach based on what we experienced, um, in our own lives and, and that sticks out well. So, um, for me now I'm still in Florida, I'm in central Florida where it's hot. We do treat the run, you know, as first you're surviving it, you're being smart, you're being safe. And then second, if all is going well, then let's worry about your speed, your placing, your qualifying and, and all that kind of thing. Um, so I'm a stickler for, um, hats to keep the head cool and to hold ice, um, icing, ice in the suits, ice in the hat, taking water, pouring it on you. Um, and, uh, and, and I've had a couple people, no, oh, I don't, you know, want to run with socks. And I'm like, well, that's fine. But you know, have you run in shoes with wet feet for 26 miles and, and, or 13 miles and, and how that's going to play out and, and making sure that it's an enjoyable experience. Then we can worry about whether it's a PR or you've qualified for, you know, world championships, et cetera. Yeah. And and do you have the same strategy again on the run with uh, getting through the, the dark patches with having something at the finish <laughs> line or? Right, right. Uh, more opportunity there that um, the cheering is going to happen. And I think you can get away with, with the eating, <laughs> the eating trick more on the bike than you can on the run. Um, now that I'm coaching and, and retired from racing, I try to be at more of these events. And um, we've teamed up with a, another uh, local bike shop so that between my coaching squad and, and the bike shop squad, you know, there's usually a tent set up with um, cowbells and, and jingling and cheering and yelling. And um, and obviously your family or your support group is there. Um, so that probably gets you through. But if, if we... I have found that if we take the surviving it first and then worrying about how fast you're going, it, it stays more of a positive because you're not really um, pushing yourself yeah. to a point where it, it should be miserable. You know, we, we're not in this. That's, I've got one of my athletes. He, oh, he loves to say, he's like, this is just a hobby. <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. <laughs> What what about pacing? Uh, so on the run, do you focus on mainly surviving it uh, due to the heat, among other factors? But in general, on in all three disciplines, is there anything that we should mention about pacing that we haven't talked about yet? Pacing on the run is so difficult because you know that you're going to fade it's inevitable. It's the end of a triathlon, even a 10 K, even the WTF, excuse me, the WTS athletes in a sprint, the gosh, the first one K of those athletes is mind boggling. And that is the fastest that they will run either in the 5 K or the 10 K. And the same kind of thing applies to age groupers or even elites. Um, in the, in the, the long distance races is that yes, the beginning is going to be your fastest, um, pace and, and realizing that that's going to happen and realizing, and, and you're right, you know, that is, that does tie into what you said about getting into a dark zone. If you aren't properly prepared and, and educated with your coach or your, or your racing plan to know that that is going to happen. If you think you're going to hit an Ironman run and your pace is 704 and you're awesome, 704, 704, 704, 705, 710, 725, if you aren't realizing that that's going to happen, then that, yeah, that's absolutely going to put you into a, a negative place. So knowing that that pacing is going to drop off and having a plan for it, um, uh, maybe if if you do have a 704 average pace that is your goal it's going to need to start off faster than that if if it's going to happen um, no matter what and and your training would prepare you for that but 
knowing and being prepared for that drop off um, is is one of the best things. And I think, again, that's going to keep you out of that that sort of negative self-talk that creeps in and then just causes everything to go down the tubes once that happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the bike, do you have uh, d- do you want them to do your athletes to do a more even pacing there compared to the run, or uh, or is that also sort of you you mentioned starting actually slowly while you're hydrating and and right. starting right. the rolling buffet? But what's your thoughts on the bike? For me, my thoughts on the bike is if you're going too fast to eat and drink, you're going too fast, um, and uh, if you're not if if you're pushing to that heart rate level that when you take a sip, half of it burps back up and, and, you know, drops on the ground or you're chewing and you're just, just, you know, it's, it's making you sick. And so you decide to stop chewing or stop eating. That's the end of the race. So we do judge. And again, I'm working with a few athletes that are at power meter level and, and a lot of others that on the bike are, are mostly at rate of perceived exertion or heart rate. So, um, for them, it is just, a that is how we pace it is if you can eat and drink at your normal planned thing, then you are going at a good pace and, and feel free to see if you can push a little more. But as soon as you get to that point where the nutrition isn't going in, you know, it doesn't matter if you're going a half a mile an hour faster and you're going to take what, you know, three, four minutes off of your bike split, you're going to be walking the last six miles of the run. So we talk about how, you know, pre talking about how the bike is going to affect the run and preparing for that, um, eventuality. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, what about like, how do you learn these things as an elite athlete? You've had uh, your opportunity to do a ton of races. <laughs> is, is that something that you think that age groupers should perhaps, uh, do race more than some do? So, some of course do race a lot, but, but a lot of them might just do an Ironman and maybe a half Ironman leading up to it and, and not too much more? Or or can you actually learn to to execute really good races with uh, quite limited racing as long as you have a good plan and you, and you are aware in training of what you're doing and, and practice in training, so to say? Agreed. Both will work if, bo- you know, if both have to work. Um, okay. We are so lucky. I am so lucky in my Florida location in Central Florida that you can do, you know, two races each weekend from March until, well, thank you, Challenge Daytona, until um, the middle of December, <laughs> which we just <laughs> finished our last local race. Um, so here for us, um, racing is not um, something that we, you know, whoa, how many are we going to do? You know, every, everyone's out there um, participating. For me, it is. Um, it is a big thing at the beginning of the year is that we work out what are the A races and what are the B races versus what are the training races where Coach Sarah is still going to put a six mile run in after this local sprint race because you're here just to, you know, have fun with your friends and participate. Um, so we're still going to get something out of that. Um, if performance is your goal, if you are up at the the top end of your age group and, and qualifying for things and PRing is super important, then I think you should have the mentality of an elite athlete. And you will see that the elite athletes race and race and race and race. And that's because you have to learn how to race. It is a skill and it is not something that you can, um, reenact in training sessions very well. So racing tired, who cares? You're just out there to learn how to get in that race mode, how to turn the brain off, how to push yourself beyond what you're capable of and and do that. So for us here, yeah, great. We go out and do that, you know, every other Saturday um, locally and, and we get that that race mode in. I get it. Some people aren't in locations where that's easy or their life doesn't allow it. Family obligations work, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you do the best that you can with putting yourself into race mode for a training session. And that is sort of like what I talked about earlier when you treat the 7 a.m. start of swim practice as a 7 a.m. race start. And so you go through the motions ahead of time of acting like it's a race, going to bed early, getting up, doing your race stuff, and then going to the pool and doing something hard or having a friend meet you there because you want to race them in a, you know, a 4k swim and, and get that sort of race experience going. Um, so 
you it is you do what you can, Michael. If if you have the ability, great. You're lucky. Um, if not you're going to have to work a little harder to create those situations for yourself. Um, but either way, have a purpose each time that you go out in a race. Is it, um, can I ride harder on this sprint race and still run the same 5k time that I'm capable of? Um, and, and we go test that theory and you blow up at mile two. Well, great. We just learned something and you had a good hour training session for the day. All right. Yeah. Really great answer. Really great answer. So, so after the fact, after the race, how do you as a coach analyze your athletes races or how do you think that athletes, uh, whether they're uh, coached by, by you or somebody else or self-coached, what should they, what should they do after the race? How, how should they, should they analyze it? What should they write down, et cetera? And how should they learn from what they just did in the race? Right. You said it right there. They should write something down. Um, it's so easy to be, you know, 48 hours outside of a race and only remember the major milestones, whether they be good or bad. Um, but you know, after, after that first initial, you know, one to two days, all those fine details do disappear. Same kind of thing for me. I, I, we finish a four day adventure race. It's, it's a, you know, it's a year later. We talk about the same six things that happen now. I mean, there were four days um, of racing in there, but it's still the same six stories because those are the things that stick in your mind um, and you're not going to really um, absorb anything from that. So, you know, grabbing either your training peaks account. <coughs> excuse me, either grabbing your training peaks account and, and writing some notes on the race or keeping a journal. Like we know Gwen Jorgensen was phenomenal at doing. She would write daily um, and, and give herself goals and everything. Or, you know, if you just scribble something down, you know, somewhere and, and you keep track of it. Um, but sort of just piecing out those things, couple, three good things that happened, three bad things that happened and, and three things that, you know, you're going to work on in the future. And I, I think that's actually what Gwen's daily thing was. It was, it was something similar, um, where it was three positive things from the day and, and like three things that, um, she wanted to work on and then three goals, uh, that she would set for the next day, something similar. But, um, if you are, you know, going from race to race to race and just sort of, shaking it off and, and going away and getting back to training, you know, what are you learning from it? How are you going to perform better at the next one? Yeah. Uh, again, really great answer. And I, I love that, uh, that idea of having free positives, free things to work on and, and free, free goals. That's, uh, that's really great. The final question that I have for you is, uh, is a bit different. It's not, it's not about, um, uh, racing. It's more about since you, uh, you have the background in elite racing, uh, both uh, as an athlete yourself, but also being in- involved with USAT and and uh, and seeing people like Gwen go out and crush it. Uh, I was wondering, what are some insights that you can share about just general athlete and triathlete development uh, that you've learned from the elite racing scene that uh, that also applies to age groupers? What I have seen, Michael, is that all personalities, all body types, all mentalities, all strengths and weaknesses is everybody can succeed. You have the Gwens who are the type A and the putting the things down in notes, religiously tracking everything from sleep to eat to this, that, and the other, um, down to some athletes that I travel with that will show up in their wetsuit is ripped at a WTS race because they hadn't checked it from the last race three weeks ago to realize that when they stripped it off in, in T T one, it, it had torn apart. Um, but they're, they're all succeeding. All of this type of athletes are at the high end and, and obviously everything in between from the long, tall and lean and skinny to the short and stocky and strong, you know, you see that podium just rotating through, um, men and women, um, et cetera, unless it's Mario Mola and we know he's always on the top because he's always the fastest yeah. runner. <laughs> <laughs> But um, not only is it body type, but it's mentality and approach to training. And and I get to know these athletes. I myself was one of them and had, you know, they were my friends at that point in time when I was racing and my training partners. Um, and now it's it's the multitude of athletes that I'm traveling with. And I'm seeing 
you know, all the different interactions that they have and, and how serious or casual they're, they seem to be taking it in their, in their life. And, and just that's because that's what works for them. But all of these people are in the, the elite of the elite, the upper echelon of the sport of triathlon and racing on the WTS series. So when you take that to yourself, whether you're in the sport for participation and, and finishing, or you're in this sport for qualifying for Kona um, or, or world championships, don't write yourself out of it because you are not X, Y, and Z. That That isn't an excuse. Um, you make do with X, Y, and Z and, and you take X, Y, and Z and you go, well, you know, these aren't my weaknesses. This is how they're actually my strengths. It's because maybe I am not triathlon focused 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you, you don't treat that as a negative, treat that as a, Hey, when I am triathlon focused, I am focused, but then I go and I have fun and I enjoy life. And I remember that it's a hobby and I spend time with my family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, same for all of us, you know, body types, backgrounds, um, swimming backgrounds, running backgrounds, whatever you're coming to it from. Um, nothing is canceled out. If you do look at the backstory um, of these elites, some are from, you know, coll collegiate swimming, collegiate running, um, never have done anything in their <laughs> collegiate world and, and picked up triathlon later in life. So um, use what you perceive as your negatives and, and find them uh, to be positives. Yeah, I think at the very least, if you if you've been to to college, you you're probably pretty good at that hydration part the, for the long long distance. <laughs> Absolutely, the Florida swim team could put down a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's move on to the the rapid fire questions, uh, and these are really short and fast. And uh, the first question is: What's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to triathlon? Well, I mean, that would have to be my swim workout blog, of course. Um, over a thousand swim workouts up on a blog for free that anybody can access. And uh, three levels, uh, A workout, usually upwards of 4K, a B workout in the 3K range, and a C workout um, in the 2K range. Yeah, I, I've used them. They're really good. And we'll link to it in the show notes. What's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? Oh, my favorite piece of gear. Uh, does a pillow count? Because um, napping was my favorite thing <laughs> as an athlete. Um, favorite piece of gear is my swim goggles. Uh, and it's easy to travel anywhere in the world. Um, plop on some goggles and you can turn an ocean into a swim workout if you want. And finally, what do we wish you had known or done differently at some point in your career? Does my 15 seconds start now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do I wish I, I, I sent the, I sent the questions to you in advance. Ah, <laughs> <you're doing. laughs> um, nothing. Absolutely nothing. I loved every moment of my triathlon career. My family supported me at a young age, and I get to, to support other people now in middle age. So I love triathlon and everything that has it has brought to me. Okay, brilliant. Uh, finally, tell the listeners where they can uh, find out more about you, your coaching, and uh, anything anything that you want to plug. Go ahead. Oh, th thank you. Um, we are uh, Swim Like a Pro. Um, and if you just Google that, our website, I'm sure Michael will link. We are located in yep. Central Florida. Um, we would love to have you come in town and, and work on swim technique. You'll also find me on a lot of um, swim articles in Triathlete Magazine. And uh, with the Slap Triathlon team is, is out swim biking and running all through the beautiful hills of Central Florida. Come join us. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was uh, really great fun talking to you. And uh, yeah, talk to you again yeah. soon. Thank you, Michael. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. I'm sure you could tell that I really enjoyed the conversation with Sarah. I think it was uh, a very, very down-to-earth view of racing, which uh, keeps things simple. And on race days, things things need to be simple because it there's just so much going on, so much adrenaline pumping. It's so easy to make mistakes if, uh, if things aren't routine and things aren't easy enough that you can actually do it without thinking. And I guess... 
if uh, if we were to boil it down to one key takeaway, it is that all of these things that you do on race day, uh, you should be practicing them in in training. Of course, if you if you want to believe that you can do something on race day, well, you better practice it in training before and uh, see that you can actually do it. And this goes whether we're talking about things like doing a flying mount or we're talking about uh, nutrition, what sort of nutrition strategy you have or equipment, as we mentioned as well, and as you heard in the teaser quote. So that's the main takeaway for me from this episode. Let me know what you thought. You can go leave comments about this episode on the show notes page. Just go to thattriathlonshow.com and click through to this episode and leave any comments or questions that you have uh, in that comments section. In the next episode on the Triathlon Show, we will hear from Triathlon Swim Coach Tim Floyd, who will talk about USRPT, which is a training methodology. Uh, it's ultra-short race pace training. And uh, it's quite talked about in the swimming world, perhaps not so much in the triathlon world yet, but you'll hear from Tim Floyd, who has used it with great success in a triathlon-focused setting. So he really focuses on triathlon swimming. So that is a very interesting conversation that I have with Tim. Uh, If you are new to the podcast, make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes as they are released. Uh, Remember that these episodes come out every single Monday and Thursday. The Thursday is typically a shorter episode, like a QA and a or similar, and the Monday is uh, a longer form interview. The download numbers for the podcast dropped for the first time in a long while in uh, December, which I guess is natural given that everybody is very busy during the holiday season. But if you are one of the listeners that uh, had to miss a few episodes because you were busy shopping for Christmas gifts or preparing food or cleaning the house or whatever you may have done, uh, make sure that now that uh, we are in January of 2019 that you go back and catch up on those episodes that you may have missed because uh, I can promise you that the quality of the episodes was uh, high as ever. So you don't want to miss them. Do go back and check them out if uh, you ended up missing anything during the holiday season. Big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com, now also available in Australia and New Zealand, as I mentioned at the top of the show. And you can get your first box for free with the promo code That's Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps, on precisionhydration.com. And big thanks to Retool, that you can find on retool.com forward slash TTS. That's R E T U L dot com forward slash TTS. Learn more about the Retool Fit process and find a Retool Bike Fitter near you on that page. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.